Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Murray. I'm a partner down in the Miami office. It is truly a privilege and, and a pleasure for me to be able to introduce this next session of our conversations about race. As many of you know, we started this series on having conversations about race in, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, murder. And all of the events surrounding that led to a racial reckoning. And people began to have questions and conversations about race relations here in America and really around the world. And it was those conversations as we began to try to understand each other and move towards uh, inclusion and equality for all people that we began and launched our series about conversations about race. We've had a number of interesting speakers, fabulous sessions throughout um, last year into this year. And truly, I am excited about the session that we have today. We have a phenomenal individual who's going to give us a unique perspective. Now, just to my task simply is to introduce him and get out of the way. But I do want to share this one story with you. When he was about 12 years old or so, he was having conversations with his grandfather. And his grandfather took him with him to various sessions where he would sit down and lead interfaith prayer meetings and trying to bring some understanding and reconciliation between the Hindus and the Muslims and the Sikhs over in India during that time and having some significant discussions about reconciliation. It was during those conversations when he was 12 that he got to witness and observe before his grandfather was taken from him far too soon that it set him on the path of his current work and his life's work. I mean, in those conversations, he learned how we ought to be reaching out to each other with an open hand. His grandfather was Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Mahatma Gandhi, as, you, as many of you know, is credited towards inspiring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here in America um, with his concept of satyagraha. Satyagraha was more or less the concept that with a truth force or a love force that you can actually change the world through social and deliberate action, but keep it nonviolent. And that nonviolent movement and that nonviolent soul force and love force and truth force is what shaped the American civil rights movement through Dr. King and others. It's what led to all of the wonderful accomplishments as India began to fight for its independence and, and, and became, as they went through their struggles to separate from the British Empire at the time, all of those things inspired him and he became a part of it. He is a historian, a journalist, an author. He's written over a dozen books. In addition to having written over a dozen books, he's also written articles and, 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 and numerous papers and magazines. He's currently a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, none other than Raj Mahan Gandhi. He's our speaker. I'm looking forward to everything that he has to say because he can talk to us about the connections between Dr. King's work and the Mahatma's work in India and how all of those things contributed to his own life's work. Even when he was in the parliament of India, he's been constantly on the forefront of the fight for equality. And in addition to that, he is a, just a, a phenomenal person and, and, and wonderful human being who I'm looking forward to hearing from. He's going to be led through this conversation and discussion by our own Limo Charian in our Chicago office. So without further ado, I turn you over to them and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm really excited about today's conversation with Professor Rajmohan Gandhi. Uh, Professor Gandhi, I would like to start by talking a little bit about your personal connection with your grandfather. Um, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi is someone who the rest of us regard as Mahatma Gandhi. 
but for you, he was someone that you had to share with the world. So I want to ask you a little bit about what that was like. If you what, what did you call him? Do you have any personal, particular memories that you'd like to share with us? Um, thank you, Limo, and thank you, Jason. Uh, Jason, your remarks were powerful, and I really appreciated them. And Limo, you're asking me about sharing my grandfather with others. Before I offer those remarks, let me say that uh, doing this with the KNL AIDS community is a pleasure for me. Now, as far as sharing Gandhi with India was concerned, the family had no choice. Gandhi had accepted all of India as his family. All of India owned him. He was everyone's possession. We called him Bapuji, father, as did so many others in India. But neither he nor his children, grandchildren, could deny the family pull. The bond was deep. It was shown whenever he saw us, in his eyes that lit up, in the broad smile that filled his face, or in a hug that he gave us. But for much of my childhood and boyhood, he was either in a British prison or somewhere far from where I was, trying to bring peace to places of conflict. He had no home of his own. For him and family, it was a 30-year non-violent war. Now, in 1943-44, when I was eight, I went twice with my parents and siblings to see him and our grandmother, Kasturba, when they were prisoners in Pune, and where our grandmother died as a prisoner shortly after our second visit. From the summer, summer of 1946 to January 30, 1948, in the final 21 months of his life, he spent long spells in New Delhi, where my father was editing the city's leading newspaper, the Hindustan Times. He was going from 76 to 78. I was going from 11 to 12 and a half. My youngest sibling, Gopal, or Gopu, was going from 1 to 3. In this phase, we saw a lot of our grandfather. Not that he stayed with us. He lived with those who were called untouchables in one of their community settlements. And in the final phase in the home of his friend, G.D. Birla, the industrialist. We saw him before, during, and after his 5 p.m. multi-faith prayer meetings, open to the public, where he also offered remarks on what was happening in the country. Occasionally, we called on him, called on him at about 8.45 p.m. or 9 p.m., which was his bedtime. Gopu my baby brother, called him Dada, grandfather. And that seemed to please him. And he roared with laughter when little Gopu mimic, mimic, mimicked my grandfather's prayer meeting line, do minute ki shanti, silence for two minutes. Now, what was printed on my mind, as Jason pointed out, was my grandfather's face when he, conf when he was confronted with hostility by people who disliked the fact that he saw all Indians, including Muslims, including untouchables, as his brothers and sisters. My grandfather's face was, at this point, a sad face, a fearless face, a friendly face, friendly even to those who seemed hostile to him. Well, I, I, I can imagine that would be the case. Um, I, I will say, it must be some level of pressure having Mahatma Gandhi as your grandfather. Um, would you mind telling me the story about when you got new spectacles? Well, I'll tell that story. And you're right, of course, about having him as a grandfather and the pressure that it meant. We knew his values. We knew his values. Frugality was one of these values. He would ask his grandchildren to open up the envelopes in which he received letters to produce clean pages on which he could scribble notes. Now, the spectacles. So I was, um, I think, nine or ten when I first got my spectacles. And here I'm meeting him in this uh, settlement of people who were called untouchables in 46 or 47. I'm 11 years old, and I'm wearing a new pair of glasses. And knowing his uh, keenness on simplicity and frugality, I'm a little interested in how he was going to react. But I said to myself, there's so many people that come to see him. He's talking to so many people. Surely he may not notice my new glasses. 
but I was wrong. When I arrived and I greeted him, ah, ah, so you have new glasses. Now I had prepared myself for this. I said, you know that my eyes are weak. I needed a new pair of glasses. Yes, you also needed a new set of frames, he asked. So this was his trying to remind me of some of his values. I appreciate that. I, you know, I want to talk, turn to, to um, Gandhi's legacy. Um, you, in 2017, wrote a book called Why Gandhi Still Matters, an appraisal of the Mahatma's legacy. What made you decide to write that book at that time? Well, from 1947, the year of independence, India has been trying to practice democracy and the values of democracy, such as equality for everybody. However, by 2015 and 2016, the drive for Hindu supremacy in a land of many religions had picked up momentum. Gandhi's vision of an India where everyone felt safe and respected was under threat. That was the main reason for my wanting to write the book. Moreover, there was a good deal of misinformation and disinformation on major questions connected to Gandhi connected to the freedom movement, to India's 1947 partition. Uh, it seemed to me that recalling what he stood for, recapturing his vision for India was necessary. So that was uh, what lay behind this, this book. Professor Gandhi, Jason mentioned um, Satyagraha. Um, and you know, you've described that as one of the key aspects of Gandhi's legacy. Actually, you've called it a weapon of nonviolent resistance. What do you think the place of Satyagraha is in today's conflicts? Uh, as Jason pointed out, Satyagraha, Satya is truth. Graha means hanging on to, clinging to, insisting upon it. Truth force, love force, soul force. Now, any student of world history can only marvel at the boldness of the Satyagraha idea. So you are in India, you are opposing Britain's rule over India, you resist British rule, you resist to the last and you risk everything. You invite imprisonment or worse, but you refuse to hate the Brits, the British people. And in the end, you win independence. In the end, you win British friends even. Now, when anyone in any part of the world with their friends and associates, uh, decide to launch some kind of nonviolent resistance, satyagraha. A massive levels of force may drown your resist resistance for some time. Massive levels of control may make your resistance almost impossible to carry forward. However, it is possible with persistence, with luck, you might manage to win sympathy, many parts, even the sympathy of the race or the community on the opposite side. And this is what happened with several of Gandhi's campaigns in India. And this is what happened with the civil rights campaign here in the 1950s and 1960s. This is what happened with the non-violent movement of the United States, as so many people know. Now, as I see, as I see it, if I may just add one or two more lines, as I see it, Satyagraha, or nonviolent defiance has a future if those employing it are able to show two things. One, that your cause, your goal is just. Two, you provide confidence that after you win, that after you win, you and your team will not create the injustice you are now opposing, that you will end injustice, not recreate it. That absolutely uh, makes perfect sense to me. You did mention, and Jason mentioned, the influence of Mahatma Gandhi on the civil rights movement worldwide. And specifically, we've heard from prior speakers in our conversations about race series, about the impact of Gandhi's teachings, particularly on Dr. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders in the movement, um, in the civil rights struggle in the United States. But I understand the connections to Gandhi obviously predate Martin, uh, Dr. King. So I'd like to ask you, tell us about your knowledge of the connection between Gandhi and the civil rights movement in the U.S. 
So I do have some knowledge on this and I will take some time to respond to this question. I'll take some minutes on this mm -hmm. because this is a very major question. And as Jason mentioned, and as you mentioned, Dr. King himself has written and spoken about this in more than one place. It seems that Martin was a 19 year old student at Crozer Theological Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania, when after Gandhi's assassination in January 48, King heard of Gandhi's nonviolent philosophy from a professor. Then in 1950, when King was 20, he went to Friendship House in Philadelphia to hear Dr. Mordecai Johnson, president of Harvard University, who had visited India after Gandhi's death. We have King's own words on what happened when he listened to Dr. Johnson. Quote, Dr. Johnson's message was so profound and electrifying that I left the meeting and bought half a dozen books on Gandhi's life and works, unquote. Thereafter, and again, we have King's own words to that effect. King felt that Gandhi's was a moral and practical way for oppressed people to struggle against injustice. King said that Gandhi, quote, lifted the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful, effective social force on a large scale, unquote. Now, there was a critical difference between Gandhi's India and King's America. In India, Indians were a great majority fighting a small, though powerful and well-armed minority of British rulers. American blacks were a defenseless minority with living memories of slavery in a predominantly white society, white polity, white economy. Yet King had this prophetic insight that nonviolent force, what Gandhi called Satyagraha, clinging firmly but nonviolently to the truth, held pro promise even in the US. We all know that in the 1950s and 1960s, this insight was amazingly vindicated. Many who have written about this historic nonviolent movement of the 1950s and 60s have underlined the connection with the struggle that Gandhi led in India. The late John Lewis, whom I had the privilege of meeting, has done so in his autobiography. David Halberstam's wonderful book, The Children, has described the connection in detail and numerous other books. However, the man who has spoken and written repeatedly and most compellingly about this is the astonishing Reverend James Lawson Jr., who I should add, turns 93 today. today. Yet before King and Lawson and so many others made history here in the US, there was a 30 year interaction between Gandhi and African American leaders, and I'd like to dwell on this. Now, in 1911, on September 9, 1911, Gandhi, who was in South Africa at the time, wrote in his journal, Indian Opinion, about Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, whom Gandhi had never met. Quote, Dr. Du Bois is a great man amongst the world's great men, unquote, said Gandhi's Indian Opinion in 1911. Then in 1917, two years after Gandhi returned to India from South Africa, Hubert H. Harrison of Harlem wrote that Gandhi was preparing Indians to stand up to the British Empire. In 1921, Marcus Garvey told an African-American rally of Gandhi's success in forging a Hindu-Muslim alliance for India's freedom. Added Garvey, quote, if it is possible for Hindus and Mohammedans to come together in India, it is possible for Negroes to come together everywhere, unquote. That was in 1921. In August of that same year, 1921, Dr. Du Bois published in The Crisis, his journal, the entire text of an open letter to every Briton in India, an open letter that Gandhi had composed. African Americans appeared to draw hope from the struggle of dark skinned Indians against the British Empire. The Crisis Journal repeatedly invoked Gandhi. In July 1929, the Crisis published on its front page a signed message from African Americans for African Americans from Gandhi, which the journal had obtained from Gandhi. In this message, Gandhi said, quote, let not the 12, let not the 12 million Negroes be ashamed of the fact that they are the grandchildren of slaves. There is no dishonor in being slaves. 
that is dishonor in being slave owners, unquote. In that July 1929 issue, the crisis called Gandhi, quote, the greatest colored man in the world, and perhaps the greatest man in the world, unquote. In 1931, when King George V invited to tea, a group of Indian leaders who had arrived in London for political talks, Gandhi went to Buckingham Palace in the clothes of an Indian peasant. The Pittsburgh Courier, the African-American journal, called Gandhi, quote, an unusually brilliant man who refused to bow to the conventions of European civilization, unquote. In 1932, a year after this, when the empire again imprisoned Gandhi, the Chicago, Chicago Defender, another great African-American newspaper, wrote in an editorial, quote, what we need in America is a Gandhi who will fight the cause of the oppressed, one who, like Gandhi, can divorce himself from the greed for gold, one who can appreciate the misery of the oppressed, unquote. Now, a significant milestone was Gandhi's meeting in February 1936 in a hut in Bardoli in Western India with a four-member African-American delegation led by the thinker and philosopher Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman's wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, and Edward and Finola Carroll were the other three meeting Gandhi. After a three-hour conversation, which was recounted by Gandhi in his journal in India and recounted by Thurman in the US, this is what Gandhi said to the four African-Americans, quote, it may be through African-Americans that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world, unquote. Now, by this time, Gandhi's longing that India would exemplify nonviolent direct action to the world had taken hits. Indians seemed reluctant to let go of ill will between Hindus and Muslims, to let go of domination by high castes over so-called low caste and so-called untouchables. Gandhi's frank and probing three-hour conversation with the two African-American couples in 1936 seemed to give Gandhi a sense, a prophetic sense, that leadership in nonviolent direct action would come from African Americans. Now, a year after this, in 1937, two other distinguished African Americans, Channing Tobias and Benjamin Mays, called on Gandhi, who by this time was in another part of India in another hut. Channing Tobias headed the YMCA's Race Relations Committee. Benjamin Mays was a minister and civil rights leader who would become well known as the president of Atlanta's Morehouse College. Tobias asked Gandhi, what word shall I give to my brethren as to the outlook for the future? Replied Gandhi, quote, right is on the side of your people. If they choose nonviolence as their sole weapon, a bright future is assured, unquote. Then on July 1, 1942, the month before he was again imprisoned by the British, Gandhi wrote a frank letter to President Roosevelt that also addressed the African-American question. Said Gandhi, quote, under foreign rule, we in India can make no effective contribution of any kind in this war except as slaves or serfs. The Allied Declaration that the allies are fighting to make the world safe for freedom of the individual and for democracy sounds hollow, said Gandhi to Roosevelt. So long as India and Africa are exploited by Great Britain, and so long as America has the race problem in our own home, unquote. Now in the summer of 1945, after the war was over and Gandhi was out of prison, the African-American journalists from the Chicago Defender, Denton J. Brooks Jr., elicited one of Gandhi's best known remarks. Brooks asked Gandhi, quote, do you have a message for African-Americans, unquote? Gandhi, who was observing his weekly silent day, scribbled out his reply. He wrote on this piece of paper for Denton Brooks, my life is its own message, unquote. 18 months later, in December 1946, when India's independence was not far off, the country witnessed a Hindu-Muslim divide 
which in some places broke out in major violence. Gandhi went to Noah Kali, today part of Bangladesh, where violence had taken place. Also in that part of India at the time, also attempting to work for peace, was an African-American scholar, William Stuart Nelson, a dean at Washington's Harvard University. In December 1946, Nelson called on Gandhi in his hut in a village called Sri Rampu, now in Bangladesh. They had a two-hour talk on the situation of African Americans. In Nelson's words, the meeting proved to be, he wrote, quote, one of my very great moments in India. The two hours in Gandhi's retreat were packed with an inspiration which will abide with me. The impression which I bore away derived from the extraordinary spiritual and intellectual qualities which are revealed even in so short a time. Mr. Gandhi has a complete mastery, wrote Nelson, over the material demands upon his life. His room could scarcely have been plainer. His mind met our problems most directly and constructively, unquote. Gandhi invited Nelson to his public prayer meeting on December 3, 1946 requesting Nelson to offer a Christian song. The prayer meeting was attended by hundreds of men, women, and children from this village of Sri Rampur and its neighborhood. Muslims comprised the large majority. The rest were Hindus. Nelson rendered Isaac Watts's famous hymn, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. When Nelson had finished, Gandhi, the Hindu, paraphrased the Christian song for the largely Muslim audience, most of whom did not know English. A few weeks later, Stuart Nelson and Gandhi were again together, this time in Kolkata, then called Calcutta. Nelson spoke of the violence in India. He asked Gandhi why years of teaching nonviolence had not prevented the killings that were taking place. Gandhi answered that India's nonviolent campaigns against the British had not been truly non-violent. Often, said Gandhi, the resistance had been inspired by violent feelings. Indians had harbored ill will against the British. They had not tried enough to awaken the better element in the English people. Gandhi went on to say to Nelson that secretly harbored anti-British violence now recoiled upon us and made Hindus and Muslims fly at each other's throat. Now, the reality was that the twin components of Gandhi's nonviolence, fear not and hate not, were both difficult to practice. But the first, fear not, found wider acceptance than the second, hate not. In that well-known book, Discovery of India, which was written in prison, Nehru, who would, be, who would become India's first prime minister, wrote of the change Gandhi had brought to India, saying that the dominant impulse in India under British rule was of pervasive, oppressing, strangling fear. Nehru added that thanks to Gandhi, quote, that blanket of fear was lifted from the people's shoulders, not wholly, of course, but to an amazing degree. It was a psychological change, almost as if some expert in psychoanalytical methods had probed deep into the patient's past, found out the origins of his complexes, exposed them to his view, and thus rid him of that burden, unquote. Gandhi was telling Nelson that while Indians had imbibed fear not, they were less keen about hate not. Hating the British quickly and easily turned to Hindus and Muslims hating one another, hence the violence. So I, wa I wanted everyone to be aware of the depth and frankness of Gandhi's connections with African Americans. Thank you. Professor Gandhi, you know, one of our previous speakers uh, was actually Re Reverend Lawson, and uh, he also specifically mentioned um, the interaction with your grandfather. I do want to ask about um, Gandhi's impact on other global civil civil rights icons like Nelson Mandela and the Dalai Lama. I understand you've actually met them um, and just wanted to ask if you could tell us about your interactions and Gandhi's influence on them as well. Um, I'd be glad to. 
Nelson Mandela was in India in the year 1990, shortly after he was released. One of the first countries he visited after his release was India. At that time, I was a member of the Indian Parliament, member of the upper house of the Indian Parliament. I flew with Nelson Mandela on the small aircraft which the Indian government had placed at his disposal to three amazing cities in India outside New Delhi, to Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is, to Varanasi, the great Hindu city of ancient uh, history, and to Kolkata. And, and, and on this uh, trip, uh, the Indian pilot made sure that uh, Nelson Mandela could see Mount Everest. Now, during this time that I had with uh, Nelson Mandela, he was not yet the president, although he was the most uh, uh, amazing and charismatic, and popular, loved leader of South Africa. Um, everyone wanted his autographs. So I noticed how uh, people would, you know, uh, Indians were keen to get his autographs and then not everybody had autograph books. Some of them would just put a scrap of paper under his face or nose and request him to give his autograph. Painstakingly, patiently, one after the other, Indian asking for this was, was obliged, was, was responded to by Mandela who signed his name. That was one side of him that I saw. But I also saw that between these places, as we, we were flying from one city to the other, uh, Mandela had a couple of his uh, aides in the African National Movement with him. And he was then still the commander of the Liberation Army. And he was issuing absolutely crisp instructions to these people as any commander would. This was the other side of Mandela that I saw. And then in Kolkata, which is, uh, which is where the British used to rule India from, which has a wonderful house built, built by the British, now the house you, rule, used by Indian rulers, Indian governors of that area. That is where Nelson Mandela was put up, I was put up. So when Mandela left this house, this Raj Bhavan, as it's called, he wanted to say goodbye to everybody. And he went along these long corridors, not just one, but three or four of them, to seek out the humble servants in this mansion who had looked after him. They were too shy and nervous to come out and say goodbye to him. But Mandela went all the way, searching out these people and thanking them and saying his goodbye. So now this is my observation of Mandela when I was spent time with him. But Mandela's similarity with Gandhi, which is also what you asked about, can be seen above all in Mandela's clarity that the new South Africa, that in the new South Africa, the defeated white minority would still continue to have a place as equals. There was no dislike, no exclusion in Mandela's vision of the new South Africa. As for the Dalai Lama, from 1959, which is when he escaped into India, I have met him perhaps eight or ten times. And I can say from my meetings with him, conversations with him, my observation of him, my study of this remarkable man. He's a man of supreme patience and supreme fortitude. He has immense moral and spiritual stamina. Despite rebuffs, he asks his Tibetans to remain totally nonviolent. He has repeatedly underlined his willingness to be part of China. And despite many rebuffs and mental pain and suffering, which I've noticed even in some of my conversations with him, he retains his faith and his hope, and he retains his smile. Well, that's, uh, that's great to hear about that. I do want to talk, we, we've entitled this, um, this discussion, this conversation, um, Gandhi's views on race, religion, liberty, and equality. And certainly in his quest for Indian independence, your grandfather had to contend with all of those issues. I'd like to start with race, again, given our the focus of our conversation. Can you talk about your grandfather's um, positions on race and how they evolved over, over time? 
Well, thank you, Lima, for asking this important question. A relevant question because there has been some discussion and controversy about this. So here is my response. Long ago in the year 1893, Gandhi went to South Africa as a 23-year-old attorney hired by an Indian trader, discovering from the moment of his arrival that Indians in South Africa who had arrived there as British subjects were being humiliatingly treated. Gandhi organized the Indians of South Africa. He fought for their dignity. He discovered Satyagraha there. He won significant rights for the Indians. And eventually, in the year 1915, he returned to India. Now, while in South Africa, the condition of Indians there had absorbed Gandhi totally. South Africa's Indians, South Africa's Chinese, and South Africa's Africans lived in different worlds. There was very little interaction. For some time in South Africa, Gandhi was ignorant and prejudiced regarding South Africa's Africans. While demanding rights for the Indians of South Africa, he sometimes used offensive language regarding the educational attendance of Africans. Sadly, in those years, that, that was the attitude of the entire Indian community. In fact, that was the attitude of much of the world, sadly. Gandhi not only overcame his ignorance and his prejudice, in 1908, while he was in South Africa, he offered in a public speech in Johannesburg a far-seeing vision for all the races of South Africa, a vision that may not have been art articulated by anyone else at that time. In a speech at the YMCA in Johannesburg, this is what Gandhi said in 1908, quote, in studying the Indian question, I have endeavored to study the question as it affects the Africans and the Chinese. We can hardly think of South Africa without the African races, continues Gandhi. If we look into the future, is it not a heritage to, that we have to leave to posterity that all the different races commingle and produce a civilization that perhaps the world has not yet seen, unquote? This is in June 1908. Now, the word Gandhi used, commingle, was and is a radical word. Gandhi used it in the year 1908. During Gandhi's time in South Africa, a remarkable relationship was created between him and John Langali Dube, two years younger than Gandhi. Dube, who was born into a princely Zulu family, became one of the founders of the African National Congress. Both Dube and Gandhi ran centers in Phoenix near Durban. Both published journals from there. Now, a student at Dubey's Center in Phoenix, a man called Albert Lutuli, went on to become the president of the African National Congress in the 1950s. In 1961, Lutuli was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his struggle against apartheid in South Africa. People know about Mandela's Nobel Prize, Archbishop Tutu Prize. But in 1961, Lutuli won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, Mandela has written about Lutuli. Mandela has. Mandela calls Lutuli, quote, a passionate disciple of Mahatma Gandhi, unquote. Now, in a talk at Harvard University in 1948, Lutuli said that there was no doubt that Gandhi's efforts for his people inspired people such as Dr. John Dubey and others to concern themselves with seeking human rights for their people. In other words, the Indian effort was then, uh, in, it inspired the African effort in South Africa. Thank you, Professor Gandhi. Jason had talked about how we started these conversations about race years after the murder of, of George Floyd. Um, you know, certainly in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement is confronting systemic racism. Can you talk about anti-racism and specifically how that relates to Gandhi's teaching? Now, Gandhi understood that racism is a child of arrogance, of cruelty, of insecurity. 
Gandhi understood that at bottom, racism is based on grading people as high or low, higher or lower. You want to be top dog, you want to be the bully, and you want others to call you boss or master. That is racism. Now, Gandhi's passion was totally and completely against any notion of high and low. It was based not on lining up people, comparing and grading them, but on accepting the God-given dignity of every person in the world. Gandhi's position was anti-racism. It was pro-dignity, pro-respect, pro the individual human being. As Gandhi wrote in 1946, he wanted a world where, quote, the last is equal to the first, or Gandhi went on to say, or in other words, no one is to be the first and no one is to be the last, unquote. Quite revolutionary. Um, I, I do want to turn to religion. Um, your grandfather was assassinated when you were young by a Hindu extremist um, who believed that he was too favorable toward uh, Muslims. Can you talk specifically, you'd mentioned his views on secular government. Can you talk a little bit about um, your grandfather's views on religion and secular government? Well, uh, it is well known that Gandhi called himself a Hindu of Hindus. Yet he was uncompromising in his opposition to any Hindu state in India, or a Muslim state elsewhere, or a Christian state elsewhere, or a Jewish state elsewhere. Religion was each person's private and perhaps sacred matter. It was not something to be imposed on others by anyone, least of all by a government or by a state. Now, the interesting thing and the amazing thing is that even though partition accompanied India's independence in 1947, and sadly, not only partition, but a carnage, thanks to Gandhi, thanks also to Gandhi's close colleagues, Nehru and Patel and Azad, thanks also to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who led the constitution making exercise, free India resolved itself to be an India for all equally. Not an India where high caste Hindus would be first class citizens and the others second class or third class or lower. Now this achievement, this launching of free India as a secular state where everyone could hold her head high was in my assessment, a bigger achievement than India's independence. And this, secular India, where everyone was equal, lasted for 70 years and more. But it is this India, it is this India that is now under serious threat. And this is what should greatly concern the US and the whole world. Do you see this as signs of progression or progress or regression? Well, of course, this is very much a regression. But I want to remind myself and all everybody else who is understandably and rightly troubled that it's India or other con conditions where similar processes are taking place. We should know that in history, Progress has often come in jerks. Sometimes we even go back, we are pushed back, and then we spring forward. Now there was a time until recently when equality and a common humanity was, uh, were widely accepted goals. From the acceptance of equality and a common humanity, sections of the world, large sections of the world maybe, have regressed to the view uh, which says that my country belongs to authentic people, to my kind of people, people of my race or my religion or my sect. From a more perfect union, our goal has changed to tighter control by my race or my people. It is a deeply troubling situation. And all of us who are troubled need to speak out. But we, we can have the long-term faith and confidence, but God willing, 
India will bounce back. The world will bounce back. Th those are hopeful words. Um, I do want to talk about equality. Um, you had mentioned your grandfather's views um, on the caste system, and particularly t treatment of untouchables in India. Can you talk a little bit about that, and you know what has what formed those views? Uh, yeah, you know, from early early in his life, Gandhi was conscious of this great inequality in India, and as for this practice of untouchability, which, by the way, after India became free, and Gandhi and Nehru and Ambedkar and Patel and the others were absolutely clear that untouchability had to go, and it was legally abolished in in India uh, shortly after independence. But Gandhi used to say years before independence came to India, that untouchability in India is worse than slavery in the United States. And here I will mention uh, what Gandhi himself has uh, spoken of, uh, his conversation with his mother when he was about 12 years old. And there used to be a boy uh, called Uka, who came from a group that people called untouchable, and he would come to clean the lavatory in Gandhi family home. And Gandhi's mother told her son, Mohandas, don't touch this boy when he comes. Don't touch him. And Gandhi didn't like this. He argued with his mother about this. Then Gandhi said to his mother, but there are boys like him from his community, his group, uh, I run into them on my way to school. And then I, I may touch them by accident. So Gandhi's mother had said that if you touch somebody like Uka, you should have a bath and cleanse yourself. So he said to his mother, if I touch somebody like that on the street, and I can't have a bath to clean myself, what should I do? His mother said to him, Mohan, if an untouchable touches you and you become polluted, the way to cancel the pollution is, to, is then to touch a Muslim boy. And then one pollution will cancel the other pollution. So Gandhi remembered this conversation. And he knew how deep the prejudices uh, were in India in Hindus about Muslims, in Muslims about Hindus, in caste Hindus about so-called untouchables. So from an early age, Gandhi wanted to find a remedy, a cure for this shameful reality in India. And, and, and these were some of the, uh, the real incidents in his life that shaped his views. And in South Africa, where he was from age 23 to age 44, he often used to say that the humiliations that the Indians were receiving in South Africa were the price Indians were paying for the untouchability that they were practicing in India. And in India, he repeatedly said that all our sins and problems and difficulties that Indian society faces spring from this cruelty and this arrogance, treating some people as untouchables. You know, given that background as a child and the things he learned, um, he still went on to, to, to you know, uh, advocate for equality across race, religion, and caste. Um, does that give you hope in terms of the, the uh, you know, current movements and what, what the, the rights that people are fighting for. And of course, and not only him, but so many others. And there were, you know, along with the political movement of freedom, there was a tremendous movement uh, to end this inequality, uh, to end this uh, really shameful practice. And uh, as many people know that they, after independence, the uh, Indian constitution and the Indian parliaments uh, their various iterations have uh, had tremendous uh, provisions for affirmative action to, to, to remove, to reduce uh, the discrimination and the ill treatment of the so-called untouchables. And much has been done, but so much more remains to be done. 
And laws are one thing and constitutional provisions are one thing. And that's the whole world knows. But this kind of casteism, which is really also a kind of racism, is a very deep reality in India even today. Uh, but there is a very uh, tremendous uh, uh, and continuing movement all across India. I mentioned Dr. Ambedkar, who was a great leader of from that community who then became the architect of the Indian constitution and, and many others who are continuing to fight this battle. But this is an ongoing battle and it's not yet fully won, not by any means. And in terms of the battle that is being fought in terms of, again, racial um, uh, inequality, particularly, you know, in the United States as well, in the yeah. United States as well as, over, as other parts of the world, uh, would you say similar things about um, uh, that there is progress being made? Of course, great progress being made, but then there is also regression in many cases. And as I mentioned, this notion that uh, there is some kind of group, special group, the authentic group who should take the country back, that others uh, should are less than equal. This is a very powerful force that has raised its head in the United States, as we all know and elsewhere too. So uh, whereas uh, some years ago, as I said earlier, that equality and a common humanity were accepted uh, goals, now there is a change. But, but I, re I regard this as a change that the people of the world will resist and will uh, overcome. Well, I appreciate um, all the things that we've talked about. I do want to, to end our conversation on a, a slightly lighter note. Um, often world leaders uh, are asked um, if you could have dinner with any historical figure or some group of historical figures, who would that be? Many of many leaders, including former President Barack Obama, um, would, would say Mahatma Gandhi as the, one of the people that they would want to share a meal with. I'm going to put a little twist on that and ask you a question. If you could answer, if you could introduce your grandfather to three people, we're going to say not including family, who lived after his death, who would those people be and why? Yeah. That, that's of course a tremendous question, but with your permission, Limo, I will name not three, but four. That's absolutely your prerogative. Four is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> so, firstly, and my first person is an unnamed person, but I will mention her or his identity. I would like Gandhi today to meet someone from China, an intellectual, an artist, an activist, who wants to bring liberty, equality, friendship among the people of China and the people of the world. The Chinese people are a crucial component of humanity. I haven't identified this individual, but I would like Gandhi to meet a Chinese intellectual artist, activist, who wants to bring liberty, equality, friendship to China and the world. Secondly, I would like a meeting between Gandhi and, and uh, the linguist and philosopher Noam Chomsky. Thirdly, thirdly, I would like a meeting between Gandhi and AOC. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Finally, finally, I would like a long one-on-one -on -one between M.K. Gandhi and the Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr. That would be a wonderful uh, conversation to be able to listen to. I would love to be able to listen to the conversation between Gandhi and any of those people, but particularly Reverend Lawson, who we've spoken to, and that would be a, a, a wonderful conversation to be able to actually have. Um, I want to thank you, Professor Gandhi, for joining us uh, today for our conversations about race. Um, this has been something that the Diversity Committee has been proud to, to bring to the firm, and the firm is proud to bring to um, our, 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 our family here within Canal Gates, as well as our clients. We very much appreciate the time that you uh, have taken to talk to us today. I very much enjoyed this conversation. Um, and, I, and I want to extend our, our thanks to you, Professor Gandhi.
Well, it's been a pleasure for me, and thank you for for asking these uh, terrific questions. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for, for, for joining us for this latest installment of our conversations about race series. <laughs>